Good morning and welcome to our morning service today on this, the 17th of May. We're going to sing God's praises today. We're going to hear from his word. And later in our service this morning, we're going to be reading from the book of Acts chapter 2, when the promised Holy Spirit of God came and filled the followers of Jesus. And today, for those of us who are in Christ, God's Spirit lives in us. And so we can sing these words of our opening hymn with great wonder and thankfulness. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me. And what should be our response? Your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. Let's join together this morning in our praise of God as we sing King of Kings, Majesty. To continue to worship our God as we come to him in prayer now. So let's join together in prayer. On Wednesday night at the gathering, we were looking at these words from Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Gracious God and Father, we come into your presence today and we confess that so many times this week, we have sought to build our own goodness, our own perfection. We've tried to live lives that are pure and good and wholesome. We've tried to be righteous in the way we think and act and communicate. But Father, we fail. We don't live up to our own standards. The things we want to do, we don't do because we are sinners in need of you. Father God, we thank you today that you, Lord God, alone are righteous. 
that you are perfect and holy and splendid in who you are. You are righteous in the way you act, in the way you command and make judgments. All your ways are good and perfect. Father, you're righteous in the way you communicate and make promises. And Lord God, we thank you for the good news of Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that there is a righteousness from you that has been revealed and it can be received by faith. Father, thank you this day that Jesus died for our sins at the cross and that we can know forgiveness of sins. But more than that, we can stand before you, not in our own goodness, but in Christ's righteousness, those robes we do not deserve. Father, thank you that you have revealed, made known this righteousness to sinners like us through the work of your Holy Spirit to awaken our souls to our sin and need of Christ. Father, thank you that you give us the Holy Spirit to live in us, that we are sealed in Christ through the Spirit of God. Father, thank you that the Holy Spirit enables and empowers us to live this new life in Christ, that he fills us with desires for the things of God. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is committed to helping us to be more like Christ in all that we do. Today, we are humbled by your work of grace and mercy. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and our only response is to serve and live for you. Father, encourage us this morning as we look at Acts chapter two, that we may see the great work of the Spirit in the lives of your apostles and that continuation in the lives of your church today. Father, do us good this morning as we meet in our homes, as we sing your praises, as we come into your presence, as we respond to your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last two Sundays, we've been doing a sermon series in the book of Acts called Easter and Beyond, where we've been looking at the work of Jesus Christ as he continues the ministry uh, that he began in the book of Luke and continues into the book of Acts. And today we're looking at Acts chapter two. So at home, can I encourage you to take your Bibles and to turn to that chapter. We're gonna read the first 13 verses. And this morning, Bill and Doreen Calvin are going to read that passage of scripture for us. Acts chapter two, verse one to 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. That when they heard his, this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the words of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And may God bless this reading of his word. Thanks to Bill and Doreen for reading that passage in Acts chapter two this morning. And later in our service, we'll be returning to that passage. Boys and girls, uh, mums and dads, everyone at home, it's lovely to have you with us this morning. And this morning, um, I want to ask you this. Have you ever made promises? Have you ever made promises? I make them all the time. I make promises to Stephen that I'll go play football with him. Um, I make promises to Sarah that I would do certain jobs at home or be home at a certain time. And I don't know, boys and girls, whether you have made promises. 
Um, maybe over this lockdown period, you've made promises to tidy your room or you've made promises that you'll be quiet so that people can work at home. Whatever these promises are, sometimes we break our promise, don't we? And then other times we keep them. And in our passage this morning from Acts chapter 2, Jesus always keeps his promise. And in this passage that we read in, in Acts chapter 2 this morning, Jesus is keeping his promise because he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to his apostles. And that's what's happening here in these verses. And we're going to read a, a verse that reminds us of the promise that Jesus said would happen when the Holy Spirit comes. It's going to appear on your screen now and we're going to say it together. And it's taken from Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And here is what it says. Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit would come, he would, this is what would happen. Say it with me. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So Jesus told his apostles, wait for the promised Holy Spirit. But when the Spirit comes, you'll receive power and you will be Jesus's witnesses. Last week, we met the apostles. We're going to meet them again now and find out what happened in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came. So boys and girls, we were learning last week about the apostles. Here they are again. Do you remember last week? Remember, there was only 11 of them, but we added Matthias and that made 12 apostles last week when Matthias was added to the apostles. And in Acts chapter 2, in the reading we had today, God sends the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the followers who are with them that day. And we're told in the passage, boys and girls, that there was a sound like the blowing of a strong wind. I wonder, could we make that sound at home? Maybe um, put your hands up to your mouth and make that blowing sound like a storm. <sighs> Let me hear it at home. Let me hear you make the sound. And this is what the apostles heard, the sound of a very strong wind coming. But also they saw flames of fire which rested on them. And boys and girls, look this morning, these flames of fire landed on each of the apostles. It's a wonderful story, isn't it? And what was happening was there is then is that they were able to speak in different languages so they could tell people about Jesus and be Jesus's witnesses. There's lots of things to learn about the Holy Spirit, boys and girls. We see dramatically today that the Spirit of God comes by wind and fire and enables the apostles to speak different languages. But today, what about the Holy Spirit today? And there are five things, boys and girls, it's up on the screen in front of you this morning about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit today is, is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sins, helps us to see our need for Jesus. And number three, what a wonderful thing, the Holy Spirit lives in us. And then number four, the Holy Spirit can help us to pray and understand God's word. The Holy Spirit is committed to making us more like Jesus. So just like on that Pentecost day, the apostles were enabled to speak different languages, the Holy Spirit is given to those of us who are Christians to help us live our lives for Jesus. And that's something to thank God for today. Boys and girls, we're going to sing uh, the song wide and long and high and deep. Do you remember the actions for that where you put hands out for wide, long is straight ahead of you, high, hands up in the air, and then your hands down on the ground. But in the middle of it says, and we pray that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's make this our prayer and response to God's word today, wide and long, high and deep.
Thank you for joining with us uh, today and over the previous Sundays that we've been able to put these services online. I hope they're of benefit to you and encouragement to you. And before the restrictions kicked in in mid-March, uh, we as a church family were working our way through a book and in the sermons and through home groups called Why Bother With Church? And there was a quote in that book uh, which really challenged and encouraged me as we were working our way through uh, that little book. And here is what the quote said. It said, you're a member of the body of Christ and you express that membership by belonging to the body of his local church. It's a great quote, isn't it? Saying that we belong to Christ, but we also belong to his people locally in the expression of that local church. And today I just want to encourage you as we belong to Christ and belong to each other, we're going to be doing that over this coming week as we join at Youth Club on Friday night at 7.30 via Zoom. We're going to be joining with Christ and joining with each other as we do home groups this week. So on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday night, there's a home group in, uh, online that you can join in and, and connect with God's people. So please contact me if you'd like to be part of a home group and I'll put you in touch with the person who's running it. Also, the gathering is not on this week, but it is on again on Wednesday, the 27th of May. And all of these are opportunities for us to connect with one another, to express our commitment to God and to his people. And so let me encourage you outside of Sunday mornings to try and connect in with these different activities. Thank you so much for those who have asked for the little book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Thank you also for those who have managed to give it to friends and family or out in their area. We have given out as a church family over 550 of them, but I still do have some of them left. And so please come and get a copy for yourself or get a copy for a neighbor or a friend uh, this week. As a church family, uh, you know that we support uh, some different missionaries you know that we have certain costs in the church and at this time uh, our giving and our tithing is very much down at the moment and I just want to encourage you as best you can to think about the weekly envelopes if you want to continue uh, with those please do more than likely it's looking now that it'll be mid-July before we begin to think about meeting physically again so maybe you might find it best to post a check-in uh, to our church treasurer and details for that are in the email that was sent out but also you might want to consider setting up a regular giving or a one-off giving through the electronic uh, into the church bank account. All this money is to support mission work, it's to meet our costs as a church and uh, I just want to encourage you to consider that but I am aware that many of you are on reduced hours and different circumstances as well. As a church, we do want to express our concern and our love for you. And I just want to make uh, available again the food parcels. If you'd benefit from one of them or you know somebody that would, please get in touch so that these can be used. I can't stress enough how much uh, the elders are missing each and every one of us uh, as we try as church to do online stuff throughout this week. I know it's not the same, but I just want to stress to you that if you need support or prayer, uh, or need to speak with any of the elders, please get in touch with them and their contact details are in the email that has been sent out. All information and updates can be accessed through the church Facebook page or Instagram page and the weekly emails as well. Uh, but bless you in this week to come. There are all the announcements and we're gonna continue in prayer this morning. So let's join together in prayer. And as we pray for the needs of our world today, as a church, we support and pray for a missionary family called the Cowans who live and serve God in north of Kenya. And we're going to pray for them as part of our prayers for others this morning. So let's pray. Father God, what a privilege it is for us to be able to speak with you, to bring our prayers of thanks, but also our requests before your, your presence and before you, our almighty God. 
Father, we bring before you Stephen and Angeline Cowan and their children this morning to you. Thank you, Lord God, for the many years that they have lived and served you and the community in Tum in, in Kenya. Thank you for sustaining them over that long period of time. Thank you for giving them a desire to see the gospel reaching people and impacting and changing communities. Father, we pray for them and the people they work with, that you will be with them as they prepare for a potential invasion of locusts at this time of year, which could destroy crops and in turn cause food shortages. We pray for the different projects Stephen is working on with regard to health and farming that would enable people to care more effectively for their people and their family and their town. Father, thank you for the long partnership that our church has had with Stephen and Angeline. And we just pray for them. We pray for your grace and help that you will indeed enable them by your spirit to share the good news of Jesus at this time. And may they be encouraged by your presence, we pray. Father God, we pray for the formation of a new government in our own country at this time. Father, give them wisdom as they lead and guide us through this crisis. And as this phasing rolls on, we just pray, Lord, that you will give them wisdom and insight into know what is best. There are some big decisions to be made and there will also be the criticism. And we just pray for our leaders that, Lord, you will be their guide and that they'll be conscious of your help, we pray. Father God, we pray for our town and its people here in Drogheda. We pray for those who are anxious, for those who are wondering what the future will be like or when we'll be able to get back to some form of normality. We pray for those who've had little contact with people as the days and weeks pass by. We pray for those who are struggling with bills and food shortage, with health concerns and the loss of loved ones. All these things are for us to bring before you because Lord, we're not able to deal with all these things, but you are, and you're powerful, and you're gracious, and you're generous, and we ask that you would draw near to people in need and bring your hope and life-giving power to bear on those situations that are most pressing. Lord God, we thank you for the way you've been helping and keeping us as a church family. We thank you for those who are recovering from the virus. We thank you for those who've been able to go back to work and those on the mend in hospital. We pray for those in our congregation who are grieving at this time. Lord, be their comfort and bind up their broken heart, we pray. Father, we pray for our students and young people as they finish off assignments and do exams. As some of them are wondering what's next for their lives, may they know you as our Lord and Saviour who determines their steps for their good. We want to bring before you now, Lord, in this moment of quiet, those things that preoccupy us, those concerns for individuals and situations, and we bring them before your throne of grace in this moment of quiet. Father, hear our prayers we ask, and hear us as we say together as your people, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Before we come to Acts chapter 2 this morning, we're going to sing these words. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Let's use this as a time to prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word as we sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let the presence of the risen Lord come renew my heart and make me whole. 
Let's turn to Acts chapter 2 this morning and as we do that can I encourage you to have your Bibles open uh, in front of you and let me pray for us as we come to this wonderful passage of Pentecost at Acts chapter 2. Let's pray. Father we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your living life-giving word and we pray for your spirit's help to understand what is before us and apply it to our lives and hearts both individually and corporately as a church. And help us, we pray, to marvel at the great ministry of Jesus continued through his spirit in the work of the apostles, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The following events all have something in common. The landing on the moon in 1969 by uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong the civil rights movement fronted by Martin Luther King when he had that amazing speech, I have a dream. 1989, some of you may well remember this very vividly, the fall of the Berlin Wall, or very sadly, the tragic events of 9-11 or 7-7 in London. These events all have something in common, and it is that they are moments in history and time when life changes dramatically when there's a hurling in of a new era and the events that we've just mentioned were hugely significant. And this morning, as we come to Acts chapter two, which I hope you have open in front of you, we're coming to an event in history and time, which is hugely significant. There's a hurling in of a new era here. It's an event which will turn the world upside down. And it is this, it is the coming of the promised Holy Spirit been given to the apostles of the risen Lord Jesus. This passage that you have before you, verses one, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, can be divided into two parts, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. The first part is verses 1 to 4, and the second is verses 5 to 13. So let's have a look at verses 1 to 4. Follow it with me. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was celebrated in Jesus' day, 50 days after Passover, and it was traditionally a harvest festival. And we see here in chapter one, chapter two, verse one, when the day of Pentecost came, it says they were all together. The day meaning the 12 apostles. It also must have included the 120 that we read about in chapter one, and they're all in one place together. They're assembled. Then there are four things, four things that begin to happen and I've put them in under four S words. So four S's, not the phone, but four S words. And here they are this morning. The first S word you'll see is in verse two. They hear a sound. A sound, it says in verse two, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. David Peterson in his commentary in Acts says this, the wind is an emblem for the spirit or creative breath, pneuma of God. The Holy Spirit described as a wind here. John's gospel, do you remember back there in chapter three, it described the work of the spirit in these terms. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, 
but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with the work of the Spirit or those born of the Spirit. There's something powerful here in Acts chapter 2, uncontrollable, being communicated here about the imminent arrival of the person of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So that's the first one. They heard a sound. This violent wind had come. Secondly, the second S word is sight. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. Here we have another symbol of God's presence coming amongst his followers as the followers saw fire. Where can you think of in the scriptures where there has been fire symbolizing the presence of God? Take a moment just to think about that. What part of the Old Testament, New Testament have you seen this before? Let me give you a few examples. When God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, we know there was a smoking fire pot which indicated God's presence. Do you remember back to the time of Moses in the book of Exodus? Moses was out in the desert and he saw a bush on fire, but it wasn't burning out. I don't know if you can see it this morning, but straight in front of me is the pulpit fall. And that has a burning bush of the time of Moses as well. And that is symbolic of God's presence. And remember what God said to Moses in Exodus 3. He said, Moses, Moses, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Fire signifying the presence of God. When the law, the Ten Commandments, were given to the people of God on Mount Sinai, we are told the following in the book of Exodus. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like a smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. A tremendous fire and smoke on Mount Sinai showing that God had turned up. And here in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, we see the Spirit of God coming upon the followers of Jesus as fire. And really, it's the fulfillment of John the Baptist's words when John said this, that he had come to baptize with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the tongues of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And here we see the fulfillment of John's words here in Acts chapter 2, as God the Father sends the Holy Spirit from heaven, sounding like a violent wind, and what seemed to be like tongues of fire rested on his followers. And this brings us to the third word beginning with S this morning. The word is spirit, verse 4. It says in verse 4, doesn't it, that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They've been given God's spirit. And when this happens here in verse 4, Jesus was making good his promise, like we were saying with the children that in a few days he would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit. When this occurs, as we see here in verse 4, Jesus told them back in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came and that he, they would be his witnesses. The blessing of God's Spirit was for each individual member of the believing community here in Acts chapter 2 so that with power, they would go out and be the Lord's witnesses. It's a dramatic moment. It's a wonderful moment. And really it's a contrast, isn't it? Because there was a time when these followers were scared and doubting, but now we see that the Spirit of Christ has come, the Holy Spirit, and it empowers them to be witnesses for Christ. And we're gonna see that over chapter two. But what about today? God's Spirit is still given to every follower of Jesus. Isn't that wonderful today? Today, the Spirit is given to individual men and women, boys and girls, who come to Jesus in repentance and trust for their salvation in Him. The role of the Holy Spirit is multi-layered and multitasked. He's there to teach, to remind, to guide and lead, to convict, to transform and enable Christians like you and I to be disciples of Jesus, lifelong followers of him, 
and to enable us to be witnesses of the risen Lord Jesus. We know from other parts of Scripture that we can also grieve the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Spirit's fire. We can also be out of step with the Spirit because of our sin. But ultimately, God has given his Spirit to enable us to live the life he has called us to by his grace and mercy. Today, the Spirit is still given. Be encouraged that if you have desires for God, if you desire to follow him and be with him and be his witnesses, there are signs that the Spirit of God lives in you. We need to be careful though, don't we? That we don't grieve the Spirit, that we don't step out of God's word and be disobedient because then we will step out of sync with the Spirit, but we will also quench the Spirit's fire. This brings us to the fourth S word today. We see in verse four that there is speech part of the Holy Spirit's enabling of the disciples was that they were able to speak in tongues or languages, verse 4. Have a look at it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I wonder how your languages are today. Do you speak another language? Mine are actually terrible. I I'm, I'm freely admit that. My mother, when I was in secondary school, went to a parent-teacher meeting. Um, she met my English teacher, uh, and that English teacher was a teacher that you would not have messed with in class. Uh, she was a formidable character. And she told my mum at the parent-teacher meeting regarding English some encouraging words, but she finished with this. She said, Mrs. Burke, Damien will never be a journalist, she said. And that probably just tells you how good I was at English. And even today, I still struggle with parts of it. My French teacher in my Leaving Cert year on a number of occasions advised me to drop down to ordinary level French. I persisted with it uh, in higher level and eventually got a, a reasonable score. And I remember her words, I can't believe it. And to be fair, I couldn't believe it either. I barely passed my Leaving Cert Irish Languages are terrible for me. I've struggled with them. I've done French, English, and Irish. I've done Greek and Hebrew. I am no linguist. And yes, I wonder how yours are. I know for some of our church family that you speak different languages, English and French and other ones, Spanish and others in Portuguese, and you have your own dialect as well. We're very blessed in our church to have multiple languages. But if you were to ask the disciples in Acts chapter two, how are your languages? What do you know before this moment in Acts 2? For the vast majority of them, they would have had little knowledge or be able to speak other languages, if any. You see, these were ordinary men, some unschooled individuals who are now filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in other languages, it says, because of the end of what verse 4 says, the Spirit enabled them to do so. I think it's very important in this passage to remember that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit enabled the apostles to speak in tongues here, in languages. But don't confuse this with the speaking in tongues as outlined in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14. The languages spoken here in Acts are languages that are recognizable and don't need per se for somebody to interpret. Here in Acts, it was public and for the nations. In 1 Corinthians, predominantly, it is for the edification of the church. There's a big question, isn't there, in Acts chapter 2? Is this normative for the church to expect this today? That's an, a big question. And maybe that's a question that we could be asking in home groups or the gathering to explore that a little bit more. But I just want to say this. These are extraordinary times. The coming of the Holy Spirit as sent by God. And these apostles have a unique role in sharing Jesus and being his witness at this time. So what we see so far is that these apostles are able to speak in different languages. And on one level, verses one to four seem natural, don't they? We have the sound of the wind, the sight of fire, language has been spoken. But on the other hand, these are supernatural, extraordinary events because God is sending and giving his Holy Spirit to these followers. I find it fascinating as you look at this passage this morning that Luke takes only four verses to explain the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
But in the rest of chapter two, which we're going to do over the next few weeks, Luke's focus is highlighting what the Spirit's filling and enabling means for the purpose of witnessing for Christ. There is a dominance on the witness for Christ in, in Acts 2. And Luke only takes four verses to explain the coming of the Holy Spirit. But he explains verse upon verse about how these apostles will witness and be witnesses for Jesus as they speak to the crowd in, in the rest of Acts 2. And this takes us to verses 5 to 13, which I've called the United Nations in Jerusalem. You see, the festival of Pentecost is happening in Jerusalem at this time when the Spirit comes. And I guess today we're used to festivals happening in our time as well, aren't we? We have music festivals, cultural festivals. How many of you remember in 2018 and 2019, our town here in Drogheda embraced and hosted the Fla Ceol na Heron, which was an Irish music festival. And that brought visitors from all over the world to the town. And it was the same for the festival of Pentecost. It brought in lots of people into Jerusalem. And look what Luke says about that. He says in verse five, have a look at it. He says, there were people from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem that day, representative. And verses nine to 11 highlights the kind of people, groups and places from which they came from. You could easily think that these groups were brought up in either the Roman empire or the Parthian empire. These people groups were predominantly Jews, we can see, scattered throughout the empire, probably coming back to Jerusalem for the festival, as well as those who were living in Jerusalem at the time. But there was also a few converts to Judaism as well. And on the day of Pentecost, these groups of people gathered, it says, verse 6, because each one heard the disciples speaking in his own language. The crowd is stirred together because they heard the followers of Jesus speaking in possibly Aramaic and Greek and Latin, if not more dialects, their own language. And look at the response of the crowd. Verses six and seven, it says, they were bewildered, utterly amazed. And why were they amazed? They were amazed because they could see that these men were ordinary men, but also men who came from Galilee. Do you see that in verses seven and eight? They know, they say, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? They had another question in verses 11 and 12. They say this, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They ask each other, what does this mean? So here's the crowd on this Pentecost day, bewildered, utterly amazed, wondering how these men can speak in different languages. But the big question is, what does this mean? What is this pointing towards? John Stott says this about the Holy Spirit's enabling of the apostles to speak in different languages. Inspired and equipped for what would be essentially a verbal ministry, they were empowered to bear testimony to the exalted Christ. What are we to make of all that is happening here in Acts chapter 2? On the day of Pentecost, it is hugely significant that every nation under heaven was there with their different languages. This should have presented an obstacle or a barrier to bearing witness for Christ, particularly for these disciples who more than likely only had one language. Yet God's Holy Spirit enables the whole apostles to declare the wonders of God. The significance of all this is that there are two things happening here with Acts chapter two. On one level, Acts chapter two is looking back. On another part, it is looking forward. Let me explain what I mean by this. So it is looking back. How is Acts chapter two looking back? If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, we're told in there that the whole world had one language and one common speech. It meant people could communicate easily. And the people came up with a plan of stopping traveling to settle down, to build a place of brick and mortar. And they had a dream. And this was the dream of the people of Genesis 11, building ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we will make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. Their plan and dreams was that they would reach to the heavens 
build a name for themselves and not be scattered over the earth. The problem with that was that God wanted the opposite. He wanted the people to fill the earth, to grow and and scatter across the earth. Why? Because in so doing, his name would be declared across the whole earth. But in Genesis, the people were defying God by their attitude and actions. And so God comes down, we're told, in Genesis 11, and he confuses their language so that they couldn't understand one another. And with their great plan, goes up in smoke because they can't communicate and they're scattered just according to God's plans. You see, the Tower of Babel and all that was happening in it is an act of God's judgment. But here in Acts chapter 2, what do we see? When the Holy Spirit comes, rather than the different languages being a barrier, the Spirit overcomes that language barrier. And Acts 2 is a reversal of the judgment of Babel. It is actually a redeeming of the judgment as people hear about Jesus and the wonders of God in their own languages. So Acts 2 is actually a reversal of Genesis 11 and the judgment of Babel. But Acts 2 is also a looking forward as well. How so? We will see over the next couple of weeks, and please, I want to encourage you to read ahead in Acts chapter 2. We will see that at the end of Acts chapter 2, people will hear about the wonders of God. They'll have been told about who Jesus is, that he is the Lord and the Messiah, the Christ that is to come, and they repent and are baptized. And so the work of the Spirit is a continuation of the work and ministry of Jesus, of drawing people from different nations, languages, and tribes under him, under his name. John Stott puts it this way. It acts to, it prefigures the great day when the redeemed company will be drawn from every nation and tribe and people and language. Acts 2 is only the beginning of the great purposes of God. Acts 2 is looking forward to what we read about in Revelation. Let's read it together. It's up on the screen in front of you. Let's encourage each each other with these words from Revelation 7. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a vision, what a future, what a looking forward. It is people from different nations, ethnicities, multilingual, declaring the praises of God and the Lamb. This is what God's spirit is involved in here in Acts 2 in a phenomenal way by enabling these apostles to speak about God's wonders in the life and teaching and ministry of Jesus Christ the Lord. Ever since the day of Pentecost of Acts 2, we are moving toward Revelation 7. Isn't that amazing? So if you're here this morning as a follower of Jesus from Ireland, from one of our African nations, from Asia or South America, or Eastern Europe, God is bringing together under Christ, under him, the Lord and Messiah. He is bringing a people together who will continue to declare the wonders of God. And in Jesus Christ today, others are going to be invited in to be part of that wonderful picture. How do we look at these verses today? These are supernatural, extraordinary times here in Acts 2 that shape and direct the early church and these New New Testament apostles as they went out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. The same Holy Spirit is at work through the gospel, revealing and drawing men and women to the exalted Lord Jesus Christ today. The apostolic era may be over, but we have God's word and his church, and Jesus is continuing to minister through his Holy Spirit to make people know that they can be rescued from every nation, tongue, and language, and tribe, and that we are moving towards that picture of Revelation 7. There are barriers to overcome, hostility of the world around us, cultural obstacles, political, internal walls, but God's Spirit in Acts chapter 2 began that day to hurl in a new beginning, 
a beginning when people would gather from different nations and different people under him and declare the wonders of Christ to the world around them. We look forward to hearing more about Acts chapter 2 in our services over these next couple of Sundays. But today, be encouraged. The Spirit of God is still at work and he's still using his word and his people to declare the praises of God. And what a blessing that will be when we stand in Revelation 7 territory with different nations and different backgrounds of people praising God and the Lamb of God who died for them. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. We're going to close in prayer and then we're going to sing again. So let's, let's pray. Father God, what a wonderful passage this morning from Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, comes to those followers on the day of Pentecost, enables them to speak in different languages. Why? So that they could declare the wonders of God to a diverse group of people from every people under heaven. Father, we thank you that Jesus is continuing his ministry through the Spirit of God, at work in his church and his people today, that we would declare the wonders and praise of God to every nation under heaven. Lord, help us in that task. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to walk with us and teach us and guide us and transform us and enable us. And we pray today as we head out into another week, help us to be your witnesses. Help us to know the wonders of God and to declare his praises. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning says these words, Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven come down to earth. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Let's respond to God's word as we sing, Love divine, all loves excelling.
been great having you this morning. I'm delighted we were able to sing God's praises together, to pray and to hear from his word. And after the service, we're going to have our virtual coffee together. So if you can join uh, via Zoom, the details are on the screen, but also in the email that was sent out during the week. And if you can come for a few minutes just to say hello and to connect with God's people, that'd be wonderful. It'd be lovely to see you all. We're going to close in by saying the benediction together. Let's say it together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.